I'm Jerry Williams, retired agent, author, and podcaster, and you're listening to True Philadelphia Podcast with Matt O'Donnell. Jerry Williams spent her first career working as an FBI agent in the Philadelphia office. Her specialty was investigating complicated white-collar crimes. She was one of the few black women working for the Bureau in the beginning and one of the few when she reached retirement. Williams was able to reinvent herself post-FBI into a successful author of fiction and nonfiction and the host of a popular podcast that focuses on FBI case files interviewing the agents who worked on them. Jerry Williams is the quintessential example of someone successfully creating a second act in life. How she did it why she did it right now in the true philadelphia podcast jerry williams so great to see you again thanks for joining me on the true philadelphia podcast why thank you i am absolutely thrilled to be here so let's talk about your podcast first fbi retired case file review 200 episodes and counting three million downloads and counting Congratulations. Tell me about the podcast and why people love it so much. Well, I started the podcast really to be a vehicle, a platform to sell some books. But I started it in January of 2016. And as we all know, by the fall of 2016, the FBI had been pulled into the uh, political climate and it wasn't pretty. And what happened was that so many people who had questions about the FBI, started listening to the podcast. And I really feel good about it because one of the things that I promised myself and I promised my listeners is that I won't get into politics, even though I have very strong political uh, opinions of my own. I keep that out of it. And I allow people to meet FBI agents and make their own opinion, make their own judgments. Let's talk about that a little bit later. I want to get into that more. Uh, but first, you know, j just for our listeners here who are listening, watching, 26 years with the FBI, most of it spent in Philadelphia. You did a lot of investigations with like Ponzi schemes, telemarketing scams, a lot of white collar crime. Uh, and then you and I met when you were the spokesperson for the Philadelphia FBI office. What got you into the bureau in the first place? Why did you join? Well, that's, a, <laughs> I would say, economics. <laughs> I became an economic fraud investigator, but I, I came in because of economics. I was a juvenile probation officer, what they call in Virginia, an aftercare counselor. And, uh, you know, I worked with juveniles uh, who had been adjudicated, and uh, it was a wonderful job, but it was not great paying. So at one point, uh, you know, I was looking around for other opportunities, and I found this newsletter that said that the FBI was looking for women and minorities. And I went like, check, check. <laughs> and uh, then when I saw that I would be doubling my salary by uh, leaving the probation office and going to the FBI, I thought to myself, yeah, <laughs> let's look into this. I really, I had to admit that I really did not know exactly what I was getting into. Now, my roommate in college, who's still my best friend now, uh, was a police officer in Baltimore. So I had, you know, I knew what law enforcement was about and I knew that I could do that. But uh, I learned really uh, on the job. When you joined, how many other black women were on, in the FBI? Uh, there were 22 others throughout the nation. So uh, black women made up when I joined about 0.5%. And we've grown. We now make up 1%. Of you the, doubled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we doubled. We now make up about 1% of the total number of uh, agents in the FBI. Why aren't there more black women in the FBI and what caused it to grow? Well, first of all, why aren't there more women in the FBI? Because women only make about, up about 20% of, uh, you know, the number of uh, of, uh, of you know, compared to the number of agents. Uh, they only make up about 20%. And I, I don't know why, um, because, you know, the FBI job is definitely law enforcement. And in general, there's only about 15% women in law enforcement. 
And so the FBI is doing well with 20%. But it also involves, you know, so many aspects of accounting and law and just so many other things that, you know, it's a great opportunity. And as far as, as uh, Black women, um, you know, I think it's just really the, a numbers game and the percentages. But, you know, I, I know I'm doing my part to encourage as many Black women and women in general to, you know, look at the FBI as a, as a serious uh, opportunity. During your time spent working at the Philadelphia FBI office, craziest case you worked on? Oh, it had to be the New Era case. I mean, that was wild. Um, Explain remember to that? people who don't know. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the Foundation for New Era Philanthropy was a, a case in Philadelphia where there was a foundation that was supposed to be doing good work. They were getting funding from anonymous donors uh, to help charities and institutions, and it was fabulous. I mean, people were were you know just begging to be a part of this foundation to be able to get money from this anonymous donor the catch was that you had to put money in before the anonymous donor will double your funds and of course it all ended up you know to be a ponzi scheme and uh, at the very end it was 350 million dollar ponzi scheme that affected charities and institutions all over the country. So a lot of the cases that you worked on were extremely complicated. And you mentioned, you know, you have to have these skills with the FBI with accounting and, and other things that involve numbers. Were they ever boring to you working on these no. cases that other people might <laughs> see in that way? No, no, never. I thought I found it extremely fascinating to just look at what people did to take other people's money. I mean, white collar crime was always just so interesting to me because the con men, you know, also all considered themselves to be the smartest person in the room. And so when I walked in, they were like, <laughs> here she comes. And so it really was exciting for me to look at a situation because white collar crime cases, as we've just said, are complicated. And sometimes, you know, somebody did something but you, you haven't been able to determine exactly what it is and if it's illegal. You know, is it just a, a civil disagreement, you know, bad business, or is it a crime? And so all of those complicated concepts and things that you had to look at, I found fascinating. Fascinating. Did you, did you find that when criminals looked at you, they immediately underestimated you because of who you are? Yeah. I had one guy who just thought he could sweet talk me, tell me I look like Gladys Knight. Well, I don't think I look like Gladys Knight, but it's like- I'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was still how, you know, we're, we're, we're sitting in a proffer meeting, you know, your life is on the line and I'm, you know, we're talking to you about, you know, the evidence that we have. And if you, you know, if this person is going to plead guilty and in the middle of the interview, he says, you know, Agent Williams, you know, you're, you're really cute. You know, you remind me of Gladys Knight. And I just thought to myself, okay, <laughs> if that's how you want to handle this, so uh, yeah. Did that ever happen again? Someone say you look like her? No, I don't think I look like Gladys Knight. It was probably the first black woman on the top of his head. Yes, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sure now, you know, oh, you know what, uh, I would get Oprah or Michelle Obama or something like that because, <laughs> yeah, we, we know what's on the, uh, you know, the background of, the, sure. <laughs> of that, yeah. So you wrote two novels after your retirement, one pay to play, the other greedy givers, and they are about a fictional FBI agent who is a woman who investigates white collar crimes, inspired by real FBI cases, and I'm sure inspired by you. Where, how did you, I mean, I know anyone can write, but not everyone can write a book. Like, where'd you learn how to do this? <sighs> Trial and error. You know, I just studied, and I, I don't want to take away from people who do just sit down and write a book. But I actually worked with uh, a friend. I, I, I got a, a reporter I knew in the Inquirer was able to introduce me to one of the editors, one of the project editors at the Inquirer. And I worked with her on my book, you know, really developing it and learning how to write fiction because, you know, it's not easy. I mean, I've been working on my 
third novel now for over a year trying to get this together and trying to get it out because I want it to be perfect. It's, it's a difficult thing to do. So I just taught myself. I went to New York for many, many courses and seminars and, uh, you know, just really studied. I've got back here, I have probably about 50 craft books that I have, uh, and I've read every one of them, some of them twice. I really want to be, you know, an author, a writer. I really want to do stories that make people, you know, feel good and possibly even, you know, change their, their ideas or, or thoughts about the FBI. So I'm going to guess that when I ask you, how did you learn how to podcast? You're going to say the same thing you just taught yourself. Um, and, and like you said, you, you started podcasting to promote your books. So let me ask you this. What makes a good podcast? What, what is the secret to your success? Well, I know the secret to my success is that I let my guests speak. You know, I think that, uh, and, and you know this skill. I mean, as, as an interviewer, you know, for television, you know, it's not about you. You know, you are there to highlight and showcase your guest, you know, ask them questions. And I think a lot of times when I listen to other interview podcasts, you know, in the middle of it, the host is telling the story about what they did. And I don't do that. I let my guest speak. I let them tell their stories. They may go on for 10 or 15 minutes before I even say anything, because I am as fascinated as I, I want to be as fascinated as my listeners. And if I'm uh, interrupting and, you know, having to, to, to get the guest to move into a certain direction, then I'm not doing my job. So I try to set that up ahead of time with my expectations. And I'm telling you, all of my, um, my interviews are at least an, an hour long. And that's because my FBI, my, my retired FBI agent guest, really take the time to outline and, and have almost a presentation. Listening is the hardest thing people do. Yes. yes. But you know what? I cut that skill from being in the FBI because so, so really my answer, my short answer should have been, I do the type of interviews that I did in the FBI where I asked the question and then sat back and let my interviewee yeah, talk. So when you decided I need to figure out what I'm going to do when I retire, was that scary? Uh, no, it was pretty easy. I, I was a big reader. And so the concept, the idea of writing a book has always been in my background. You know, I've always, I've always known. And I took the job as spokesperson for the Philadelphia FBI office because of that. I mean, it was just, it was, uh, let me see the word, strategic. <laughs> uh, I really thought to myself, if I get an opportunity to meet other you know, people in the media to meet people, to other writers, if I can learn from them, you know, what I need to do, that when I finally write this book, um, you know, I, I, I will have, you know, a platform that I've already started to build. And, you know, it worked. Some people run away from jobs like that, where you have to do public relations, you have to speak in front of cameras, and, and for them, it might be a little scary. Yeah. yeah I, uh, the job was at times, you know, uh, scary, <laughs> I guess that's a good word, because you're dealing with very serious issues and you're the spokesperson. I'm not, I'm not speaking for Jerry Williams. I'm speaking for either the Philadelphia office, and I guess we're going to talk about SEPTA, our, you know, our, our SEPTA. So I have to make sure that what's coming out of my mouth is the perception that the organization wants me to do you know so i have to think quick on my feet and not say what i think is the right answer but say what i believe my bosses you know the the managers the institution wants me to say and uh you know it's it's scary thinking like oh my goodness did i just say the wrong thing you know that, that can be tough earlier on in our interview here you mentioned one of the reasons why you started doing podcasting about the FBI is to try and form more truths about what the Bureau is about. And there's this idea that people have that it's a deep state 
and that people in the Bureau are actually controlling the government in certain ways and there are tentacles all over the place. What do you think about all that? I wish I could curse. <laughs> Uh, it's just, it is absolutely ridiculous. We're just, you know, we're, we're a small, small agency in the scheme of the branches of the government. I mean, even in the, in the, in the Justice Department, the FBI is just one of many, you know, agencies. So everything that the FBI does, we investigate, but we can't do anything with that investigation unless the Justice Department, the U.S. Attorney's Office, you know, the Attorney General, all of those look at it and, and approve what, you know, whatever charges we want to put forth. And then that is put before the Judicial Department, you know, the judges then make final decisions. The FBI can't control anything, I mean, except for their small part which is gathering information and gathering evidence and putting that forward. And then our part ends and the rest of the justice system picks up on that. You know, we've entered this, this time where more and more people seem comfortable with avoiding the truth and to believe things based on feel rather than facts. And I'm sure you know full well that there is technology that you can actually make someone look like they're saying and doing things they never did. They're called deep fakes. What do you think this technology means for criminal investigations in the near future? Well, I do, you know, and that's something that as a podcaster, I really, because I do all my own editing. And, you know, sometimes as, you know, I, I'm editing, I want to move what somebody said you know, at one point of the interview and I want to move it to the beginning. Or maybe they used a word that uh, they stuttered and I want to take that word out. Um, I can do that seamlessly and nobody else knows that I changed the audio. I'm doing it for good, but obviously, you know, there are people out there doing it for evil. And I, I think as that technology grows. I think the detection technology will also grow. Um, I, I'm sure that we're working on ways to be able to see that this audio or this video has been altered and, and cut and edited. I hope so anyway, because like I said, I find it very easy to, to you know, change audio. Sure. I mean, I hope that you're right when it comes to a point where we can detect things just as easily as we can make them. Do you fear that maybe one day we will be in this dystopian world where the, the truth doesn't exist because no one can figure it out anyway? Aren't we already there? <laughs> I mean, I, I have had, and, and, and I really appreciate when this happens, when a listener who is like on the borderline will send me something and they'll say, you know, they'll send me an email and they'll say, I read this, you know, and it's something terrible about what the FBI did. And, you know, I can look at it and I can break it down to them, you know, and in most situations where the reason this isn't true is because the FBI can't do this or, you know, if this was illegal and they got away with it, why would anybody let them get away with it? You know, there are, you know, uh, you know, the, Justice Department and, and the courts wouldn't let them, you know, I, I try to help them understand why it just couldn't be true. Um, but, you know, there's so much stuff out there that is just, um, you know, just false. And sometimes if you use common sense, you can see that. But sometimes there's not a lot of common sense, you know, being used nowadays. You have come across so many criminals during your career. Why are people evil? Is it something that they are inherently evil? Do they learn to become evil or is it a combination of both? Uh, it's, I think it's a combination of both. I mean, you, you know, you hear about good people doing bad things and I, I you know, I've seen that. Um, but, you know, there are just some people who really get off on getting over on people. So I'm talking basically from, you know, white collar crime um, situation but there are people who really enjoy being in charge, being in control and, you know, making people do things 
are hurting people in ways, uh, you know, that, that gives them power. And, um, you know, I don't know if that's something they were born with or something that happened as they were growing up, but uh, they're definitely out there, you know? you know. I know that the FBI doesn't necessarily investigate like murders in Philadelphia, for instance, but I'm curious on your thoughts as to why the city of Philadelphia is seeing an uptick in homicides, even though this pandemic is still continuing here. Whereas in other cities, big cities across the country, they're seeing reductions in certain crimes. Uh, I, I don't know. You know, that is just, you know, I read the paper every day, the real hard copy paper <laughs> every day. And, and of course, you know, watch the news and I, I can't figure it out. You know, I really can't figure it out. You know, why, you know, you, you would think, and, 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 and that really scares me because you're talking about this summer where we all always know, you know, that the, it really gets even higher. You no, know, I, I just can't figure it out. You know, I, I can't figure out why, you know, we have these kids out there, these guys out there that are, are you know, shooting each other anyway. You know, it's just, it's, a, it's just really sad. It's just really sad. From someone with deep expertise in your field, what do you see coming out of this pandemic when it's all over? What are some of the thoughts that have been going around your head? Well, again, coming from a white collar crime, I think we're gonna see an increase in scams and frauds. I mean, people are desperate now and the con man can smell desperation. There is going to be scams having to do with loans. There's going to be scams having to do with jobs. There's going to be scams having to do with selling property. It is so ripe. Uh, unfortunately, whenever there is some type of uh, either natural disaster or, you know, and I, I guess the pandemic is still a natural disaster, you know, or some type of crisis, that's when the con men really see an opportunity to make money and to scam people. And so I think of anything that we're going to see a big increase in that. Where do you see hope? Ooh. Oh, well, I see hope every day. You know, when you look at the, the um, you know, our, our, our uh, nurses and our police officers and our transportation people who are out there putting their their lives on the line you know to to make sure that uh, you know people are, are are able to to be healthy and to get around i see hope with that every day you know people just willing to sacrifice their selves in order to help everyone else uh, that definitely uh, gives me hope I know that you live in South Jersey, but what is your favorite thing about Philadelphia? You know what? The thing about, I live in South Jersey, but you know, whenever you go away on vacation and they say, they ask where people are from, they say, well, where's everybody from? Anybody here from Philadelphia? I'm like, hey, and my husband and my kids are like, what are you doing? You're not from Philadelphia. But I really feel that way because I spent most of my time, I've been here for over 30 years working in, in Philadelphia, being very involved, uh, again, not just in, you know, the, the criminal aspect of it, but I went through leadership Philadelphia. You know, I, I've worked for, you know, the, the Philadelphia Transportation Authority. So I'm very much a, a Philadelphian. So, um, you know, I could give you a can answer and I could say the fantastic transportation system. <laughs> <laughs> but I just love the, the restaurants and the, um, and, and the people. It's, I love everything about Philadelphia. You know, it's, my, it's my, uh, my second home. I hope that all this stuff ends and people can go back to these places and enjoy them together, don't you? Yeah, I, yeah, I hope that they, uh, they survive. You know, that is, I think, one of the, the, the saddest part of this is, you know, that we are going to lose, you know, some businesses, we're going to lose some, uh, you know, Philadelphia institutions that are just not going to make it because, uh, you know, of economic issues, you know, and, and, and that is sad. Yeah. She is Jerry Williams. She is a former FBI agent, now the creator and host of the FBI Retired Case File Review. 
Jerry, thanks for joining us on the True Philadelphia podcast. Thank you, Thank you for having me. Thanks to Jerry Williams. You can find her FBI Retired Case File Review podcast wherever you get your podcasts. She also just published yet another book, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, which seeks to debunk cliches about FBI-related crime dramas. Thanks to you for listening to the True Philadelphia Podcast. Podcast.